Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us for Bonhoeffer Capital's Q2 2022 conference call. It's great to have some of our LPs as well as prospective investors joining us live. Uh, before I hand things over to Keith to walk us through his presentation on the portfolio, I just had a couple um, housekeeping items that I wanted to address. Uh, first, this presentation is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to constitute a sale, solicitation, or advice. Um, accredited investors wishing to learn more about Bonhoeffer should reach out to me separately. Um, I'm happy to connect. Uh, after Keith's presentation, we will open it up for questions and answers. You are more than welcome to submit a question in the chat at any time. Um, and if it's timely, um, Keith is happy to address that during the presentation. Um, also, if you wish to ask a live question, um, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, you can hover over and click the, the hand in your, in your video box there, and I will unmute you to ask your question. So either way works. Um, once again, thank you for joining us, and I'll hand it over to Keith. Thanks, Jessica. Glad, glad to, to see and um, and be and be with y'all. I know we haven't really done a live event probably in it's been almost like two years before COVID. I think it was like right before COVID we did our last live event. And so we thought it'd be a good idea to provide, first of all, you know, the inve investors and prospective investors sort of an update on some of our themes and some of the other aspects of what of how where, where our thinking is now in our process. And so because I one of the best ways we think that that, that we can um, get investors that where it becomes a win-win is the investors understand what we're doing in our process and, and how that all works out and plays out. And so we're gonna go through some of the specific themes that, that we've been sort of implementing over the past year or so, review some of the initial sort of themes that we the fund was sort of began with, and then we'll sort of see how those sort of play together. Again, as Jessica said, if you have any questions as we're going through the presentation, let her know. Um, because that may be easier for us to address or for you guys to basically um, be able to go with the flow in terms of the flow of what we've got here. So um, Bonhoeffer was started in, in 2007, 17, excuse me. Um, and the, our initial strategy was to, we we're focusing on value and special situations in initially emerging markets and developed markets. What's happened over time is we've our focus on emerging markets is still there. We still have a substantial on investment in emerging markets, but the strategy has involved that to focus on sort of the growth drivers. And one of the key influences behind that was just thinking about, okay, what really drives value? I mean, there's a good book called 100 Baggers that talks about what, how have some of the best stocks done over time. And a lot of it has to do with growth. And so part of what we've done is we've tried to incorporate some growth into our value framework. And so basically we're focusing on sort of growth drivers and slower growing markets where we're gonna find stocks that are probably closer to the, the companies we understand and the things that we like. And the two key trends there has been consolidation and, and, tra and technology transition, which we'll go into some detail in terms of some examples as we go through here. So first of all, our primary investment themes, we want, we're looking for areas for mispricings and variant perceptions. And so the, the main areas are initially, we. We did do some, we do compound mispricing, we'll review that. Consolidations of fragmented industries is another area that we've been focusing on. And then transitions and disruptions. Um, we have specific markets that we've been focusing on those last two ones and the third one in, but really these are applicable to any markets across the world and anywhere else. So this is really more of a general framework that we're, up trying, we're, we're applying to the specific areas um, that we have expertise in at this point. So to review compound mispricings, what these are, are there mispricings in a firm and a security actually that's a part of the firm. And what happens is you get comp, you get, in other words, you get discounts on top of discounts. Um, and so some examples are holding companies, derivative discounts and preferred non-voting stock discounts. And the last one is primarily where we've, our initial focus was on the number of preferreds in Korea, which are non-voting shares, and we continue to hold those, and I'll go through an example at the end of this of what it is, but how our, how our process has evolved over time is we've tried to focus on, we basically focus on the firms that are growing, 
and using compound mispricings as an, as an additional way to get an, a, a, a more discounted security associated with an underlying growth story. So what we've sort when we pruned the portfolio, the, the, the companies that we've pruned of ones that we felt the growth wasn't quite there. And so we want to get a combination of growth with the discounts, because one of the key things to remove the discount is actually to have growth being realized over time. If the growth is stagnant or goes down, the, disc, the, the justification or the amount of discount could actually get bigger over time. And so basically what it does is it adds some uncorrelated ways to basically win in terms of a stock going up in terms of the discount. You know, it's, it's, a, it's another factor when, when looking at stock prices. So we're focusing on multiple discounts. So we're looking for growing holding companies, as we had mentioned, growing preferred stocks, and then longer term derivatives. And some of the catalysts that, that I think are still relevant here for some of these discounts are, for example, better governance in Korea as a country, I think is, is, is going to help reduce the number of preferred common discounts. What we've noticed over time is there's a number of firms now that trade at premiums, whereas historically that's been a very rare occurrence. Um, so I think things are happening in Korea. It's going to take a while, but the, but that but as as in anything, it just you know it's the government. I, I think the government has set up incentives ahead of what's happening with companies, but I think eventually things are moving there. The example we'll give Latte is a very interesting example of that, where it was a pretty much family focused, you know, really um, it had it had a very public sort of spat between the various parties in that, and 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 now the company at least. The Latte Chilsung, which is sort of the beverage company that we've invested in, has turned around, done relatively well, and and right now they have a nice growing sort of um, bottle or franchise or, or beverage and liquor franchise in Korea. So I think that's a success story of what's happening there. Um, there's going to be some other stuff that happens over time, but we'll sort of see how that goes. Another way is to reduce the discount or spinoffs, death of a control member. We'll help with that and the new management. But again, where our focus is, has been really, as I've been on the first two bullets, um, we also look, the third bullet we've looked at too, just in terms of part of our initial screening process to find interesting companies is we'll take a look at what are called, um, in Korea, they have these events where basically they're holding company spinoffs. And we've, we've taken advantage of a few of those over time. So that's one area where we've sort of found this. Um, but again, where our focus again right now is we're primarily on sort of the growth and the better governance in some of the foreign holdings. So the way we look at this is you do a look through analysis. You can take a look at multiple income metrics in terms of the way that you look through this. And so it's a traditional way to look at a business in terms of value. You can do a sum of the parts analysis. Again, one of the key things I think on a sum of parts analysis is you always need to provide some kind of a discount because you don't have control and the market will always attribute a discount to that. And that's, a, that's I think that's the best way to try and do it. And that's, and that's sort of what we've done. In, in the specific example of Latte Chilsung, which is this one, a company that we bought, I think pretty close to inception, maybe a few years after, and we, and we continue to hold as an example of this. So what Latte Chilsung does is they have a, they're the largest um, bottler and soda provider in Korea, South Korea, um, they, they provide, um, their Pepsi, they're a Pepsi bottler. Um, and they also have a growing sort of liquor franchise. Um, so it, it, and the liquor includes both beer and, and harder soku in, in Korea. So that, so they've got, that's, that's the primary business that they have. They also have, um, two smaller businesses that are associated with beverage. They have this latte arcade, a car, which is basically, that is the Pakistani, um, beverage company, Pepsi bottler in, in, in Pakistan, which is it's, it's one of the one of Pepsi's largest largest um, areas. And then they also have um, Pepsi Philippines, which is another another area that they have in terms now, but those are relatively small pieces. The other big part of this company is they own this, this huge, say, but a good amount of real estate in a very high end area in Korea called Gangnam. And Gangnam is the is the is one of the the um, high rent districts in, in Seoul. And so they own this property there that at this point, you know, we're being conservative. We're saying we're going to put 50% of what people think the sale value of that amount is, but they, people are thinking that it could be worth up to 2 trillion won, which is a pretty good size. And you see it represents roughly 20% of the, of this business. 
Um, and so, so though that combination together, you have the debt and the cash. And so that gives you a total value of the company, probably around 2.8 trillion won, um, applying a 20% holding company discount on those assets. You divide that by sort of the shares outstanding, the common and preferred, and you get a value per share of roughly 268,000 won. Now the common is trading at 170,000 and the preferred is at 69. So what you got here is you got common, a nice common preferred discount. Um, right now, the multiple of EBITDA that's associated with the beverage and liquor business is roughly, you know, for normalized, it was 9.3, and that's based upon below. I've taken a look at some Korean alcohol comps and international beverage comps, and that's roughly what it is. But if you look at it on a net income basis, on a look through basis, the preferred, you're buying this thing for like five times earnings. And so the real difference, the reason we decided to, to, to retain this one as opposed to sell it when we're going through our growth sort of sort of analysis there was this company's actually growing pretty well. I mean, they're growing, I, I think the estimates are 10, 10 to 20% growth in EPS this year, having a dominant franchise in beverages in Korea. Um, and so you've got something that's probably gonna grow long-term maybe 10 to 15% and buying at a, at a multiple of five times earnings by buying the preferred is a great way to do it. And so what we've got here is we've got a, we've got a sort of a combination of a nice growing company with a, with a, with a good size discount that we can take advantage of. And a perfect example of, of how compound is pricing is provide some interest, provide some opportunities um, for, for companies around the world. Now, the one, the other thing with this company, as I mentioned before, is they had some real governance issues. Um, but what's happened is that is not, it was between the family about three or four years ago. Now that's actually been, been resolved and what they've actually done is they've done a holding company transaction where those are transactions where the government incentivizes um, these these families to basically sell um, the, basically a lot it incentivizes them to basically um, do good corporate governance in return for corporate governance what it allows is it allows these companies to aggregate a lot of minority interests they hold in these various companies and sell this business so they can use the proceeds of that to pay estate taxes. This is what's gonna happen in Korea over the next probably 10, five to 10 years and 20 years as you have a lot of these patriarchs of these families. And there's a very high inheritance tax in Korea. And what, that, what this does is it allows the, the heirs to basically pay the, the estate tax with minority interests in companies versus controlling interest. So they can retain control, but in exchange for retaining control, they basically need to follow good corporate governance. And Latte, I think, is a perfect example of what's happened there and an interesting opportunity today in terms of that. So, so that's sort of what our tradition, when we started out the fund, that this is an example of sort of a legacy, I say legacy, but one of the approaches that we initially started when we, when we put the fund together that, um, uh, that we took. And so the next, I'm gonna move on to areas where we've sort of, since the fund started, where we sort of branched out and added some additional areas where we found some really interesting companies. Um, first one is sort of um, fragmented consolidation in fragmented markets. Now, what a fragmented market is basically markets with sort of long runways where consolidated and associated cost economies of scale can basically lead to excess market returns. And the real advantage of these kinds of things is you can, you find these types of situations in markets that are growing at maybe GDP, maybe a little bit less than GDP, but you can get, by the time you're done with this, if there's operational leverage, you probably can get like mid-teens growth rates in some, some of these businesses where they're only growing at GDP. And the reason is because when they, when they consolidate, you get lots of cost-based synergies. And so two examples, you give some examples here, like equipment leasing is one where that can happen, where basically you've got, you can, as, as the market consolidates, you get more equipment that you can lease within a market. And the bigger players, the more scale you have, the more utilization you have, and the more different types of equipment you have. So it becomes sort of this virtuous circle. And so that's the that's example in equipment leasing. Um, automobile distribution is the same way. If the automobiles cluster within certain regions, what happens is they can take advantage of economies of scale of not only management, but other types of services that they can provide to each other. And an example of that, and we'll go into it later today, is Asbury. That's an example of that type of a company. Motor Point is another one in Cambria in the UK. And, and so these, these are examples of companies that, that what's happening is the markets are consolidating and basically 
the the businesses are getting better as they're getting bigger, but the market basically at this point is not really giving them credit for maybe not even their existing acquisitions, but are focusing on other factors. So two of the two of the, the companies that we have investments in are in are in cyclical businesses, and the market seems to be more concerned about the cyclicality of the earnings versus the potential increase that are that, that's associated with the growth in this consolidation trend. So that's an example of something that's that we've uh, that we've sort of noticed, and where 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 a lot of our focus has been these days is basically trying to identify these situations and see how they're how they're working out. So and then and then another last the last piece talks about um, somewhat innovation. We'll talk about this a little bit later in terms of of innovation versus incumbents versus disruptors and how that sort of plays out. So one of the key things in a number of one of these markets is there, there's there's a number of innovations that are happening. And sort of the real question you need to ask yourself in terms of it, these innovations, is, is the innovation going to um, disrupt the value existing value chain that exists with players in the marketplace? If it can disrupt it, in other words, by disrupting the value chain, the existing players basically are going to lose lose business by by copying the disruptor. Then that's where the big issue comes in. But in the two, the two situations where we've got, for example, Asbury and Consolidated, it's actually the opposite. It's actually the case where they can very easily adopt the innovation, and then what that does is the the incumbent has a huge advantage because they already have the customers and so the disruptor is at a big disadvantage in that case and so it's, we'll go through some some specific examples that is what we're working through here so in terms of this innovation there's a number of things that people can do you know you can uh, spin the company in terms in terms of 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 ways that from a from, from a disruption perspective different ways you can deal with the disruption you can spin the company into a new co you can keep the old co and new co together and so basically, depending upon the situation, it makes sense to do a spinoff if there's little or no synergies and there's no shared customers. You can keep them together if there's sales and marketing overlap, which is what we're seeing in a lot of business. So, for example, if we take a look at the car, car dealership business, in, in, my, in our opinion, it doesn't make any sense to spin off, let's say, like an Internet-based car selling operation because there is a good amount of sales overlap between um, and and a, a basically bricks and mortar dealership and an online dealership. There's there's there is some overlap there. Therefore, put, putting them together makes sense because of the synergies you'll get and the local synergies that happen there. So it becomes more of an omni-channel retailer as opposed to an online only retailer. And, the, and these are examples of what we've got here of sort of those types of situations and fiber connectivity that can happen, content distribution and auto distribution as we we had just mentioned there. And so in terms of consolidation, there's, there's, there's two models, I think, that we've, we've sort of, that, that people have put together. Um, I, I didn't invent this stuff, but these guys have put together some really good frameworks in terms of thinking about consolidation. Scott Management has put together something, a Canuck analyst, and there's some benchmarking in terms of return on capital. I'll briefly go through those. There are basically sources for free all to take a look at if you're interested to dive into this a little bit more in detail. And so Scott, what he does is he basically categorizes consolidators into different types. There's roll-up platform, accumulator, and hold co. Now hold co is, is probably the most disparate. There's not that much that there's not that much um, commonality. And from what I see in there, the, the, the best model to follow that is similar is basically the IAC model, which is either you either spin, spin it off, you sell it, or you operate it. That way, this holding company discount really doesn't become an issue because you have a, a, a defined event that will get rid of it. There's a, there, what, what Scott and a lot of other people focus on are sort of these platform and accumulator sort of portions, which are more of like um, sharing operational excellence programs across them, and each of them have different segments in, in front of that. So, so that's sort of what, where they're playing. And where, where we've sort of focused on has been the traditional roll-up um, type of opportunities um, and where where the market seems to be not taking into account the petition, the additional EPS growth as a result of the roll up, but they're focusing on more cyclical factors associated with the business. Um, this again is another sort of a of a 
this is a really good thing that sort of talks about some of the opportunities and things to look at for each of them. And, that, and, the, and then we, we've pretty much done this in sort of our roll-up markets where our focus has primarily been up to this point. This gives you an idea of the kind of return on capital that you can expect for different types of companies. Now, most of the businesses we're looking at, we're talking about returns on capital of 20% plus. And again, we're buying a lot of these at like below 10 times earnings. And so that combination becomes a really nice, nice situation because you probably can support to at least 10 to 15% earnings growth. Um, and buying at below 10 times earnings is a below by below, below 10 to 15 times earnings is, is definitely a, a very good sort of value combination. So, so let's go, I'll go through a specific example here. So first of all, um, let's, let, me just, let me just go through, um, through Asbury. Um, so Keith, yeah. could I interrupt yeah, you? Yeah, we, uh, we, did have a, okay. we did have a question come in um, oh. on consolidations. Uh, the question is, in these consolidation trends, don't you need some view on the terminal value, parentheses, zero dollars, if the consolidation is increasing, but the market is shrinking? For mm -hmm. instance... Mm -hmm. fixed line telcos where the number of users shrinks every year and will eventually be zero. How does that affect the value versus growth in an industry that is growing, but not consolidating like that, AI, online payments, biotech, et cetera. That, that, th those are good points. Uh, the, and specifically in the telco area, what's happening is the companies that will, are consolidating with just Telco lines, I don't think they're doing that anymore because what they actually are doing is they're rolling out fiber because that'll be the, that that's sort of the next step or the disruption that's happening in the market. Um, but that is a good point um, in the fact that you do need to take a look at the terminal values. And part of the analysis that we've been trying to focus on is finding markets that have underlying growth characteristics. They're probably growing, you know, the, they're growing at, you know, the, 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 the overall market if you combine the old co and the new co, you're probably talking low to mid single digits. Now, like in telco, if you have telco lines that are declining maybe five to 10% a year, but you can get broadband lines that are growing maybe 10 or 15% if you got a rollout like consolidated, will grow a lot faster than that. That That's sort of the common. And so what you get is, is you'll get sort of these companies that are a combination of both and the market doesn't really know how to value it at this point. Sometimes they'll, they're focusing on the legacy business and sometimes they're focusing. And so if they focus on the legacy business, then the multiple is going to be low. But once the company transitions to the new business, so for example, in telco for consolidated, if you start out with, let's say, the old telephone business, consolidated, it's overlaying, going to have this fiber optic, fiber optic link. If you model that out, what you'll see is in five years, five to six years, they'll have their whole fiber optic link out and actually the revenue is going to be growing and it's basically all primarily going to be fiber based and, and you'll and you continue to get the growth from that perspective but the key thing you need to make sure is that the, the, when you look at these things you need to take a look at okay think about like the questioner talked about what's the terminal value and from that terminal value is the business doing anything about it is the company doing something about it and as we talked about before there's different ways they can do it if the customer, there's a lot of customer overlap, they can do it. It's probably the best to do it within the same organization, like consolidate. If the customers are different, it may be better to sort of spin it off. But in most of the cases we're looking at, they have customer overlap, so they have it makes sense for most of them to keep it in house. So the that's an example. Like the consolidate is a good example of that. Asbury is another example of that. Um, or or you can take a look at a company like Ashteed and Ashteed basically has a service that isn't going away. So that one, you don't need to be as concerned about, but where you're dealing with, with disruptions that are happening, you do need to identify what the next sort of trend is and make sure, or the next sort of, I guess, distribution channel or way the service is going to be delivered and ensure the company has a plan to be a part of that future. So it's not like the company is going to be a, a, a melting ice cube. But what happens in a number of cases is you get companies, the market will value it as a melting ice cube, but it's not really a melting ice cube. And, that, and those are where the interesting situations happen. So if you look at like consolidated historically, it's been, it's had regular plain old telephone lines. Now you add the fiber optic on top of it and it becomes interesting. Without the new fiber optic link, link it doesn't become as interesting. And there's a number of businesses that are like that. I mean, even you even get you can even get into businesses like 
like Thrive, which is a software company, which is an old Yellow Pages business. So they buy a bunch of old Yellow Pages, but they're underlying building the software. And so the software basically is going to sort of be the new terminal value. And, and what you really need to do in those cases, you're, you're doing two valuations. You're doing a valuation of the declining business, valuation of the growing business, and sort of combining them together and see what it's going to look like. And it's, it's not a, a simple story. So I think that's where some mispricings well, we've been able to observe some interesting mispricings going up over time. So is, is it, was there another question there, Gesco, or was it just, just one at this point? Okay. That was it at this okay. point. Okay. All right. Um, so, so we'll go into specifically, as, so Asbury, I mean, it is a, it's, it's, I think it's got a really one of the better business models um, than the other, than the other online, the other bricks and mortar players. And part of that has to do with the fact of their clustering the clustering strategy where they just focus on buying and servicing dealerships within clusters because that's where most of the synergies are in this business and a lot of retail businesses are the same way. Um, the advantages of sort of an omni-channel retailer is you get multiple sources of revenue, new, used, service, finance, parts, and now they're actually doing online and the online sales they're making are very highly accretive because they can set up a call center, target a customer in their market and they have the ability to service that customer relatively easily for very small incremental costs, but they still get the same margin they would as if someone walks in the showroom. So they really have sort of that, that dual aspect from that perspective. And so Asbury is a company where you've got this huge consolidation happening in the business, in the bricks and mortar business. You've got online disruption in there. So you've got a lot of stuff happening at the same time. And some businesses are really doing well in terms of trying to integrate them together. I mean, the two ones that, that, that I've seen that have done relative, they're really sort of at the forefront of this on the traditional dealer sense is Lithia and Asbury. Now, both these companies have, like, for example, Asbury, you, know, you can take a look at what some of the stuff is here. They got, they've got a lot of stuff in luxury, very good, good gross, a good combination of gross profit from a number of different sources. They've got low debt and their ROEs have just been the highest in the business. Part of the reason for that, again, has been this clustering because that gives them higher margins locally and higher turns um, for inventory turns for this business. So, um, oops, sorry. There we go. Um, and so again, what the, the other thing about Asbury is, is they have a very simple playbook that they just keep on repeating and repeating and repeating. So basically their playbook is they do an acquisition, they pay down the debt with the cash flows they get from the acquisition, they buy new dealerships, they're focusing on the internet and they're buying back shares. And so depending upon whether these dealerships are they're buying are primarily family owned companies, these things don't come on the market that often. And so what they've done is when they haven't found dealerships and they've got excess cash as they bought back stock, which to me makes a lot of sense, given that the market doesn't put very high multiples on these businesses to begin with, it provides the company an opportunity to create a lot of value. If you've got an ROE of 30% plus and your stock selling for under 10 times PE, it's very easy to see buying back stock is very accretive. Um, the, the question in, in sort of the automobile dealer business, as sort of the questioner had said before, is, okay, is there a terminal value here? Or what is the terminal value here? And, and that's what the, the risk that the market is concerned about. But if you look at what's happened with Asbury is they have multiple sources of revenue. The other thing they've done is I think they're very well positioned. A number of dealers have talked about trying, and they've done this in the UK, I've talked about trying to go to what's called an agency model, where what you do is you walk into the showroom and the OEMs will pay the dealers a fixed fee to basically order the car for them. Now, the larger players like Asbury and Lithia are perfectly um, set up to do that. Um, as the OEMs, they say, okay, we want to go to a few big players, here are these guys, and they're set up and they can take advantage of the economies of scale. The interesting thing about Asbury too that I haven't seen with other ones, I'm sure they do it, but they haven't really discussed it is they focus on um, productivity per sales employee. And they think, you know, they've been able to increase that by 50% since they've sort of started and they're going to try and increase it by 50% again. Again, that's sort of a, a nice metric to say, okay, here's a, here's a way these guys are basically going to create value for shareholders going forward. They also, the other thing that they've done along with Lithia is they have this online, this online 
sort of purchase option, which has really created a lot. Like we say, we talk, it's a large one way. I think the biggest player in the market has like one to 2%, which is AutoNation. You know, Asbury's got like less than 1%. So this is a huge market that's been consolidating for the past 30, 40 years and probably can continue to consolidate for another 10 or 20 years. So this, there's, we're sort of in the middle of this giant wave of consolidation in combination with them being positioned in really nice places for dealers and other people that, that basically going forward from a growth perspective. So again, here's sort of the key things just about the automobile dealer space. And then underneath you got the service demand that's growing. Um, one of the concerns that people are concerned about the service is, okay, if you go to EVs, how's that gonna affect it? There's actually a company in Scandinavia called Bilia who is, is, does car sales in Scandinavia where most of the EVs have been purchased. They haven't seen necessarily a decline in service revenue. People are just doing something, they're just doing different services which I think is the key thing. And so the one thing they do in Billy is they'll have a tire, a tire um, storage service, because one of the things that the EVs have that the internal combustion don't have is they go through tires quicker. So I think what's going to happen is these guys are going to find ways to basically pr still provide service. The guys that provide good service to people that have cars will continue to do well. The ones that provide poor service, they're going to, they're probably going to do bad and maybe go out of business. So, so the other aspect of, of sort of the, um, the service piece is when we get to autonomous driving, there's going to have to be some kind of calibration of all the cars that are on the road. And so that's going to be a nice recurring service that service, somebody's going to have to do. And, and these guys are perfectly positioned to basically do that, having a service arm in addition to the, say, the, the, the new sales, the used sales and, and the online sales and the other and the finance and, and insurance income streams that this company has. So again, we, historically, it's good. The interesting thing about Asbury is they actually have a capital allocation committee as part of the board. Um, and it's run by a guy that used to, um, he used to be, he used to work for Michael Dell's office. He no longer does, but he's still ahead of this committee. So that's a very interesting aspect, I think, just of the business to show the commitment of what's what's really going on there. Um, that from a, from a, a, Valuation perspective, it's relatively cheap, continues to be cheap. I think the market is focusing on, um, everyone knows auto dealers are over-earning. They're focusing on the over-earning aspect of this business rather than the underlying growth aspect of the business. And I think that's true for both Asbury and Lithia. Now, some of the other bigger players, they don't have quite as aspirational growth portions or haven't laid out plans for that. And so you can say, okay, maybe those guys looking at just the, the over-earning piece as a focus, but if you, if you lay out the numbers, this, this growth aspect of both Lithia and Asbury should, is going to trump any amount of sort of over-earning they're doing. It, there's going to have some effect on it, but, the, but still the underlying growth piece is still there. Their management's aligned with ownership. Um, the equity incentives appear reasonable. They're granting about 1.1% equity per year. So it's not, not egregious in terms of compensation for folks. This is sort of our current model in terms of the way that we look at it. Um, it's growing, it's got like about a four and a half percent current free cash flow yield or roughly around 22% free cash flow yield, which is relatively cheap. If you go out five years, it's gonna be four, you know, two and a half. Um, again, and these are just using sort of, this, this is their set of assumptions. They feel at this point that they have a clear line on getting like $32 million of um, $32 billion of revenue by 2025 and 1.25 billion in sales are roughly 56. Now this was the low end, the $56 per share, but they think they can go almost up to 70 um, if they if they use their lever the normal amount of leverage. Um, and these guys have, have been proficient buyers back of stock. And so I think they'll basically be able to do that going forward too. So it may actually be higher than 55, it may be a 70. And if it's at 70 and a 160 stock, I mean, you're talking ridiculously cheap numbers here. Um, clearly the market is valuing this thing as though it's going to way over earn and that going forward, there's going to be no growth. So there's, there, there's some inconsistencies between what the price is implying here and what I, I think the company and other people have made from a plan perspective. Um, the key drivers here, and there's the nice thing about, interesting thing about Asbury, if you look at them, they're one of the few auto dealers that has good operational leverage. If you look over time, their margins have increased. Just again, I think that's primarily due to the clustering aspect of their business versus the other folks who haven't done clustering quite as much 
as Asbury has. This gives you an idea of sort of them on a relative basis. Now the churns are somewhat high now, especially for the new guys, primarily because of the, you know, the shortages of new cars. And what I think that's really gonna help out the existing dealers. It's got a one-time benefit, but given the shortages of new cars, um, they should be able to, as the new cars become available, they should be able to sell them coming out of the gate relatively quickly. I mean, once that normalizes, you know, it's going to provide them, I think, somewhat of a bridge to get from now to some point in the future where the bridge, where, um, where we can get more normalized because, you know, when we go into the next recession here, then, then they, they'll have this new car sort of premium that's still there. To, and that's really dri driven by the chip shortage and how long that lasts depends upon what's going on with the chip shortage, which at this point, I think people are saying is going to be somewhat relieved, but we'll see how that sort of plays through the rest of the value chain. So again, it's the, the very, very cheap multiples on a company that is really growing. So that, that's the sort of thing we're trying to look for. We're trying to look for situations that, okay, we, we, it's a growth story that makes sense. We can buy into the assumptions appear conservative. The market seems to say that's not the case. That's the variant perception here. And that's, and that's primarily, this is an example of the type of business that we've sort of, that we've investigated and invested in that was something when we originally started the fund, we, it wasn't part of our scope of what we're looking at. And so these are the types of things we're trying to look for. We're trying to look for these consolidations and these transitions. And so the next example is I'll give you an example of one in transition. So in essence, market in transitions are basically sort of fragmented market. What the innovations can create is they can create new or modified value chains or ecosystems. And so, and the question is, the big question that needs to be asked is can the incumbent adopt the innovation without destroying his profitability, his or her profitability. If they can, then they have a huge advantage over the disruptor. If they cannot, then, then that becomes the issue. That's sort of the issue with like what happened with Kodak and these other innovator dilemmas. They could not go, Kodak could not go back and not disrupt their chemical chain for photography but with the going to the electronic chain in terms of photography. So the real question is, is Kodak could not adopt that. And so what some companies like 3M and other people have done to basically deal with this conflict of interest is they've spun off various divisions so that they're not in conflict, they're two separate companies and let them run that way. But in the cases of the companies we're looking at here, there's good amount of customer overlap and the value chain is not disrupted to the point where that the, there's, there's gonna be a whole new value chain that's gonna be created. And, and these guys may get disintermediated as a result of that. What's that? Okay. Um, so, so, so we've got some examples here of sort of these, these legacy to mature business. You've got consolidated communication as we, we described it before, going from legacy telecom to fiber optics and script, going from legacy local TV to connected TV and ATSC 3.0 opportunities. In terms of valuations, um, you, can, you can deal with these, these companies. The interesting thing about it is you find companies that are being valued as their legacy businesses, but, the, but they don't, they're not valued as the disruptive businesses and, and how that all sort of plays together. And so you've got examples of scripts, and, which we'll go over later, and then consolidated communications. The advantages of finding these kind of opportunities is they provide what's which historically has been provided, it's called the Davis double, which means you've got companies that are growing and their multiples are low. It's also, you find this in the hundred baggers book too. They talk about what are characteristics of companies, you know, that you have high growth, plus you've got, you've got some sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, reasonable multiple. And that's sort of the combination that we're really trying to go here. Now, what are some risks in these things? There's a risk of sort of the trends, the timing of the transitions, and debt can magnify some of these risks. And so those are some of the risks that, 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 that are here associated with these sort of transitions that are happening. So, so example, so we'll give an example of Scripps. Now, his, Scripps is very interesting because historically, I, I didn't know this till I started digging into the company, um, they have a, a grow, consolidate, spin off, or sell sort of approach to capital allocation, which is something I really like because what it says, is, and, and these are examples of sort of what they've done in the past. So they spun off, he has a content unit, they spun off, spun off what's called Scripps Interactive. 
they spun off and merged their their newspaper business. But whereas before historically it was a it was a it was a legacy media business that had all kinds of legacy assets. Um, what they've done historically is they've sold their cable business and their podcasting business. And now what they're focusing on is consolidation of local TV and networks business. So they've just, they've, they've done this, the grow, consolidate, spin or sell sort of playbook. Um, and the two areas of focus we just mentioned there, they have a large spectrum holding um, across the US, which they can use for ATSC 3.0. Another interesting aspect of this business is uh, per Berkshire Hathaway owns about 35% of this business through a series of warrants that they bought in 2020 to finance this ion media transfer. So it's a, it's one of these, one of these companies, it's a, it's a smaller investment for them, but I think it shows, it highlights the, you know, what could potentially happen here. I mean, they, they sort of think through it, they're familiar with media businesses that they got involved in this all sort of adds some additional um, sort of interest, I think, in this type of a thing. Um, so, so, so the other thing that can happen um, is they have taken on debt, and what's going to happen is the large amount of cash flow will facilitate that. I mean, these guys, along with other sort of local TV broadcast stations, make boatloads of money every other year through 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 political advertising. And this year, as things ramp up, it just gets worse. And political advertising or gets it gets better for this company from that perspective. I mean. The interesting thing about political advertising is there's a huge incentive to spend all the money you have. And, and these guys become huge beneficiaries of that, these local TV groups in terms of political advertising. And it's been growing for the past 10 years. And, you know, I don't see it really changing unless there's some kind of a kind of a, uh, a thing. Uh, now, again, sort of their focus of growth here is in terms of their, they buy local TV stations and networks, they get organic some organic growth from the networks business. They pay down debt and buy back shares, very similar to Asbury, sort of the whole idea of using multiple levers of capital allocation to create value for shareholders. Again, the local TVs are sort of areas are clustered. They've been buying, they buy and sell various types of uh, areas and they have a good amount of runway. These guys are nowhere near the cap. Um, some of the other larger guys in the play, like Nexstar and Gray, are closer to the cap. So these guys can continue to consolidate in the local market if they can find appropriate businesses that they are companies they want to invest in. The one thing they've done recently, after they spun off all the stuff we talked about previously, is they bought Cats Network and Ion Network, which are basically their focus is new sort of um, content platforms. And then the question is, okay you can then then you have a multiple ways of distribution channels they can, they've got their traditional linear channel you can go through ctv well, you know once you develop these networks there's different ways you can sort of monetize the content that's being developed associated with these networks um again these this goes into some some of the details i won't go into all these but you guys can read these the, the key things here are you know retransmission fees these guys get which has turned more of an advertising model into a recurring revenue model. The, the federal elections we had mentioned, the footprints of these guys are in really good places for, for local elections, a lot of purple state um, of folk areas. Um, economies of scale for the local stations, they own the spectrum so they can do a lot of stuff with ATSC 3.0, which is gonna provide a lot more channels to distribute content. Um, sports betting, I mean, a very interesting advantage of some of these local TV stations is the latency is a lot less is, is less than other media forms. So if you wanna do sports betting um, in game, um, the local TV, local TV air companies are the best ones to do that because you don't have any, the latency is a lot less than any other medium that are out there. Um, again, as we mentioned before, the ATSC 030 opportunity, you've got better quality and picture content. And the nice thing about the thing that Scripps is focused on is basically, um, doing, you know, selling CTV ads, which gives you three times the amount of linear. And the interesting thing about that is even when they go through a platform like Roku, where they have to pay them a percentage, they still end up with a higher amount because the bump up in CPM is more than the commission they've got to pay to guys like Roku. So the network business, just historically sort of what's happened over time, as you see, been very profitable. It started out with the three networks, and then Fox added on, and then it became the cable, and now we're going to streaming. I mean, the interesting thing that people have seen over time is these older 
net forms of distribution seem to hang on. They seem to be more tied to how old people are and what they're used to. And so I think these, these legacy streams that, that the scripts has and some of these other local TV providers have will continue to go on. But what really creates the growth again, going back to, okay, it's a great company. Is it going to die in the end? What, what's going to create the growth going forward is the CTV opportunity and then the use of the spectrum and ATSC 3.0 plus some other unique advantages that the local TV guys have like low latency that they can use for sports betting and other, you know, very interactive type of activities that would be slower over networks versus directly over the air. Um, so again, these guys have good growth, they skilled allocation, the, 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 um, the valuation is reasonable. Management is incentivized. You know, they own 2.3% of the shares, decent ownership, again, modest grants. Now the new CEO, you know, doesn't, since he's new, relatively new, he doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of, of um, you know, equity ownership at this point. But if you look at the strategy and the way he does things, he seems to really do good and has a really good communication style in terms of, talking about what they want to try and do. Um, there's a number of good other investors that actually a podcast out there that interviews the CEO, which provides a pretty good, a good overview of what these guys do from that perspective. So this is, this is, I think this is a very interesting business where you've got a combination of a good smart capital allocator with a, with, with a, with an opportunity um, to basically um, going forward that the market seems to be overlooking and just focusing on the melting ice cube aspect of the business as opposed to the, the, the growth aspect of this part of the business. And again, here's sort of a, the mo sort of a, a snapshot of sort of the model and how we look at it right now. Again, we've got a 20% free cash flow yield again going forward, about 2.2%, 2.2 times free cash flow in five years. Again, assuming sort of modest growth, the reason why the things go up and down is you'll. The, the way you look at these TV businesses every two years, because in the election year, you get all this incremental revenue with practically no cost. So it's basically this big bump up every other year. And so that's why you see the, the, the bump up here. So the long-term growth here, I'm assuming is probably roughly around 2% and you're still getting a, a decent, um, you know, a, a decent piece. And so these are just some of the drivers going forward. So we'll, we'll, we'll sort of see how things, how, how things play out here. Um, and the other thing that the number of these guys do is sort of share repurchases, just sort of adding some additional piece. But the primary, the primary thing is basically understanding the growth engine that's underneath each of these and how that really works. And so here's just sort of some current pricing. You know, the the pricing is relatively cheap on all these guys, um, but uh, but Scripps again is one that's really we also own Gray um, in, in our in our portfolio. Um, one of the things that you can look at that I think is an interesting way to look at this is say, okay, well, here's the free cash flow yield, but then how does that compare to sort of the debt yield? And you see the spreads are pretty high. I mean, typically, if you look at an, an equity risk premium, which is the market on average, the spread between these two typically is about, you know, five to 10%, maybe at most, 10% at the high end. And now you've got companies that are 20, 30%. So there's something that's, in my mind, something's going on here either you know either one one of the two markets is correct the debt market or the equity market i mean the debt market seems to be saying it's going to be okay but the equity market with the free cash flow seems to say these things are gonna are gonna die so in my mind i think that's another sort of interesting metric you can use to take a look at some of these businesses but again you need to sort of take a look at the underlying business and make sure there's some kind of a growth aspect to the business there too um, so in essence, this is sort of the conclusion. It's, you know, again, this is similar to what we've seen at Asbury, very low price now, very low price going forward. Um, and so, so from a valuation perspective, it's relatively cheap. Um, the, key, the, the, the key difference between this one and Asbury is that these guys do have a little bit more debt, um, which, but they do have a lot more cash flow from the, from the elections and the other aspects of the business in combination with Berkshire you know, basically financing this, their acquisition um, at the depths of the COVID crisis provides me a little bit more confidence that, that, you know, someone else has taken a look at this plan and they feel that it's a, that it's an interesting opportunity. So that's, that, that's all I had in, in just regards to the, um, in, in regards to the, the formal presentation. I don't know if anyone else has any other questions. 
um, they'd like to do, but feel free to feel free to ask those and we can uh, we can see what's on your mind. Keith, we did have a question come in in advance um, from an LP who wanted to join us but wasn't able to. Um, mm -hmm. He'd be particularly interested to know how you feel increased inflation and interest rates are impacting the value of Bonhoeffer's holdings and whether you're making any changes based upon this new environment. Well, I, I am thinking about things a little bit different. We haven't necessarily made anything now. I mean, one of the things that inflation, you know, historically, I'm much more of the idea of on the big, big picture, you know, things, deflation happens over time just because of the large amount of debt that we have and just technology has a tendency to make stuff cheaper and cheaper. Now, there are some exceptions to that. And that's where I would think from an inflation perspective, I've been thinking, but we haven't necessarily... Um, bought anything and have looked at it. And what I've tried, what I'm trying to get myself comfortable with is looking at some oil and gas. And basically the real question of oil and gas in my mind is how long do we think these prices are going to be elevated? Because there, there's plenty of oil and gas out there. It's just a question of the incentives that have been in place. And how long do I think there's going to be a lack of incentives for people to do oil and gas drilling I mean, I think one unfortunate thing, unfortunate thing that's happened with this ESG movement is the initial, it was started out with a focus on reducing greenhouse gases was what their initial focus was, which I think should be what it is. And it's turned into kill the oil and gas industry. And the problem with that is, is it's much harder to kill the oil and gas industry and trying to reduce greenhouse gases without them helping is a very counterproductive exercise, in my opinion. I mean, oil and gas is something, it's a great resource we have. We should use it in a way that doesn't create greenhouse gases, which we can, but trying to fight people by, by basically, you know, preventing stuff from moving around just to me just seems to be counterproductive. And those are part of the reasons, part of the things I think that's happened in terms of why there is a shortage and will there continue to be a shortage? And so that, that's some of the, these thoughts in my mind on an inflation perspective. Of now, now, a number of the companies that we're investing in have relatively low price to earnings ratios and price to cash flow ratios. And what happens in inflation is those have a tendency to do better than the longer duration assets because the guys that have higher, higher multiples, in essence, what you're buying, well, you can think about almost stocks as like bonds, the ones that have the higher multiples and the higher growth rates those ones are like long-term bonds. And so they're going to be affected more by, by interest rates and inflation than the ones that have the shorter term, shorter term duration. And so, the, the, and, that, and then if you look at some of the businesses, a good number of the businesses also have the ability to sort of pass through a number of them have relatively short leasing. So for example, take a look at a company like Ashteed. So Ashteed does rel their, their lease length is relatively short. So any increase that they have, they can pass that along to, to, to their customers. And so the, we don't really have in the portfolio now any companies that have long-term sort of fixed priced um, leases or those types of things that would be, I think, really be hurt a lot by inflation. So if you've got a company that has a real long-term fixed price um, sort of contract with someone else that they've agreed to pay them a fixed price and inflation goes up, it's, it could very easily turn you upside down. Um, but the real question is how long is inflation going to last? And is it, is it yeah, I, I mean, the one thing that and people compare it to previous things, I think probably the most appropriate analogy to look at this is probably after World War, after World War I or World War II, where you had shortages and just transferring from a wartime economy to a normal economy. If you look at those situations, you'll see inflation goes up to 10%. But doesn't last more than a year and then comes back down. And I think that's what the bond market is saying. That's why bond bond yields are not super high. As people, I think, really think that the market really thinks this is going to be more more transient, which you know can somewhat of an can be a an anathema in terms of a term. But but I, but I think it may be true. I mean, if you look at the real question is if you look at the amount of inflation that's caused by shortages versus demand. And, the, and the, the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco does a real interesting metric where they break out inflation between what they feel are demand factors, supply factors, and, and neither. And what they find is they feel that, that what they found historically, and even going through now, that, that only one to 2% of the inflation is due to demand factors, and that most of it is due to supply factors. 
And so if you going back to supply, the key thing with that would be what's going to happen with China. Now, if, 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 the, if there's a large trade war and we somehow get cut off from China, that's going to be a huge thing in terms of inflation, because that's the real, that's what they're, they're, they're the supplier to the world of a lot of stuff now. But I don't think the incentives are necessarily there for them to do that. They I think they like the, the ability to continue to, to generate a lot of foreign exchange by basically, you know, producing these goods. Um, so th those, 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 at least those are, those are some of my ideas. I mean, the other aspect of it is the companies that we do that, that are levered, they do have debt that's longer term that was basically taken out when interest rates were lower. So they have an advantage in the fact that they bought, it's, it's like, it's like when you refinance your mortgage, you get, you can refinance it, you get it at a low rate and then you're fine until the mortgage is done. And most of these guys have debt that's probably going to come due in four to five years. And by then, I would think that that inflation is going to be back down again and it isn't going to be an issue. I mean, the, the, where this becomes an issue with debt, folks, is if you have a debt debt that probably comes due in the next year or two, then you may, you may run into problems in terms of having that aspect. But even the businesses that do have debt, they have lots of cash flow that they're using to pay down that debt relatively rapidly. And in addition, you know, the, a lot of them, a lot of the debt is primarily in, the, in these legacy TV businesses, and those businesses get this political revenue, which basically creates a lot of, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of cash flow that paid on that debt. Um, Great. So, so. We had one follow up question then, and we're we're right over the the hour mark, so we want to be conscientious of everyone's time. Um, but uh, now that interest rates are trending up, many corporate bonds that were issued at par are now trading at discounts. Have any companies that you're looking at taken steps to use cash to buy back debt at a discount and effectively lower the price that they paid for their assets, thus increasing their ROIC? For instance, good, ATCO good, bonds. I mean, that's that's a great point. I, I'm, I haven't seen anyone in particular, but given the, man, the number of these management teams um, approach to capital allocation, I think that's something they're probably thinking about and wouldn't be surprised, especially these companies that get these large chunks of cash flow that may be more one time. So for example, if you look at like Asbury has, has very high profitability, them looking at doing something like that, probably in a more likely case, it would be guys like the TV guys, like a Scripps or a Gray just saying, okay, my, 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 my bond selling at 60, you know, 70% of, of par, I got all this cash from all the, um, from, from the, from, from the political things. Why don't I just go out and try and buy back a bunch of debt? So, I mean, they may do that in combination. A lot of, some of these guys are restricted because of the amount of debt they have in terms of buying stock, but buying back debt can have a, a similar type of a thing when the market thinks that the yields are, are low. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's, I haven't heard anything specific, but given the the management teams that we that we have here, I think that's probably within the realm of what they're looking at in terms of capital allocation. All of them are aware of capital allocation; have done a decent job at it. Great. Well, I think that does it um, for today. We hope this uh, call has been informative and look forward to offering calls like these in the future. Um, as always, we're also happy to connect one-on-one -on -one for further discussions. So Keith, thanks so much for your time. Everyone on the call, thank you. And uh, we hope you have a great day. Yep, thanks a lot.